Humanity's rise into the light of consciousness from its dim, primal, instinctual beginnings is one of the greatest mysteries we have ever known. What was the spark that ignited this profound transformation, consequently setting us apart from all the other life on Earth? Over the course of human evolution, our brain size nearly quadrupled in roughly 3 million years. From Australopithecus to Homo habilis, the brain nearly doubled in size over a period of about 2.5 million years. Then, suddenly, a rapid expansion of the size of the brain and neocortex, along with increased neuronal density, resulted in another, more than doubling. This time occurring over a period ranging from only 200,000 to 800,000 years. Theories as to the why and how are in no short supply. There really is no consensus as to the exact cause of this unprecedented leap in human cognition, but it is clear that this is what set our species apart from all the other life on Earth. At the close of the 20th century, the renowned ethnobotanist and psychonaut Terence McKenna championed what came to be known as the stoned ape theory. Terence McKenna is one of my all-time favorite thinkers and speakers. Dubbed by some to be the intellectual voice of rave culture, he truly was a visionary, a wordsmith. In the early 1980s, McKenna's lectures at UC Berkeley would cover a wide range of topics, including psychedelic drugs, shamanism, alchemy, metaphysics, language, technology, and even memes. However, today we'll focus primarily on his famous hypothesis, the stoned ape theory. Put simply, as our distant ancestors were adapting to changes in the environment, they would have been required to seek new food sources. During this experimentation, they would have surely stumbled upon psilocybin containing mushrooms. These mushrooms, when taken at varying doses, would have offered evolutionary advantages such as increased visual acuity, sexual arousal and social cohesion, and access to transcendental states. Perhaps the most important mechanism at work here is their capacity to compel one to speech. In these expanded states of awareness, proto-hominids could have been inspired for the first time to verbally communicate their thoughts and ideas, and so begins language. In Food of the Gods, Terence begins by elucidating the relationship humans have between plants, foods, and the psychoactive drugs they contain. On their capacity to influence human behavior, he says, quote, The ways in which humans use plants, foods, and drugs cause the values of individuals and, ultimately, whole societies to shift. Eating some foods makes us happy, eating others sleepy, and still others alert. We are jovial, restless, aroused, or depressed, depending on what we have eaten. Fertility and sexual potency, degree of visual acuity, sensitivity to sound, speed of motor response, rate of maturation, and lifespan. These are only some of an animal's characteristics that can be influenced by food plants with exotic chemistries. Human symbol formation, linguistic facility, and sensitivity to community values may also shift under the influence of psychoactive and physiologically active metabolites. A night spent observing behavior in a singles bar should be field work enough to confirm this observation. Often I like to think about the effects that psilocybin would have had on archaic humans. Their subjective experience would have been the definition of a novelty having had no cultural influence or previous knowledge about any such things. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that if a pre-literate hominid were to ingest, say, 5 grams of psilocybe cubensis, then a profoundly awe-inspiring shift of awareness would be experienced. This would surely leave a lasting impact on such a mind, especially one with absolutely no idea that such states of mind are possible and one can only imagine how effectively this could serve as a catalyst for imagination and innovation in prehistoric man. 
It seems quite reasonable to me to suppose this, that the inclusion of a consciousness expanding, mind manifesting mushroom in the diet of early man may have been the most significant factor present in catalyzing the invention of tools, social hierarchies, symbolic and religious practices, and art. In other words, history as we know it. In attempting to answer the question of exactly which hallucinogen might have been responsible for the emergence of consciousness, I'll mention several important points for narrowing down the search. The plant must be native to Africa, as there is an overwhelming body of evidence to suggest that this is where Homo sapiens first emerged onto the scene. Furthermore, this African plant should naturally occur in grassland regions, and it should be psychoactive in its natural state. To suppose that the first visionary experience our pre-literate ancestors had might have come from something that required preparation seems unlikely. Extracts and concentrations are obviously products of a more developed culture, where consciousness and language are fully realized. And lastly, this plant must be easily noticeable, obtainable, and abundant. All of these requirements weed out a lot of potential substances, making psilocybin the most likely contender. A handful of different species of fungi containing psilocybin are endemic to Africa, with Psilocybe cubensis being the most potent one. And what is it about the African grasslands? Well, it is in this kind of environment where large herds of ungulate mammals would roam, and sprouting from their manure was the mushrooms. This link between humans, cattle, and mushrooms seems to reach its climax throughout the Neolithic, and we'll explore it in more depth later on. Upon ingestion, psilocybin is metabolized into its active form, psilocin. Psilocin is the compound that directly affects the central nervous system, primarily acting as a partial agonist at serotonin receptors, particularly the 5-HT2A receptor. This interaction is believed to be responsible for its cognitive, emotional, and hallucinogenic properties. The action of psychedelics also involves a temporary dampening effect on the activity of the default mode network, a large-scale network within the brain that mainly comprises a portion of the prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, and a few others. Research done by Robin Carhart Harris and others has shown that this temporary shutting down of the default mode network decreases top-down inhibition and increases bottom-up information flow. What this means is that the brain's usual control over thoughts and sensory input is reduced. This allows more raw sensory data and spontaneous thoughts to enter conscious awareness, resulting in one's subjective experience becoming more vivid, complex, and immersive. Moreover, psychedelics like psilocybin have been shown to rapidly induce synaptogenesis and neuroplasticity, allowing for increased connectivity between different areas of the brain that could aid in creative problem solving and group decision making. By increasing curiosity, associations, explorative searching, shifts in perspective and insights, they can offer new knowledge of old information making it an ideal tool for the shaman. One of the main shamanistic uses of psychedelics is for divination, that is, for procuring otherwise unattainable information. Shamans would use these plants to communicate with supernatural or ancestral spirits in an attempt to solve diverse problems and social quandaries, to diagnose and treat illnesses, to have foreknowledge of the future, or to ensure the success of future hunting expeditions. The inclusion of psilocybin mushrooms in early man's diet would offer different advantages depending on the amount consumed. Small amounts, consumed with no awareness of its psychoactivity while in the general act of browsing for food, and perhaps later consumed as a supplement, offer a noticeable increase in visual acuity, especially edge detection. In research conducted in the late 1960s, the psychopharmacologist Roland Fisher administered small doses of psilocybin to graduate students 
and then assess their ability to identify when parallel lines started to diverge. He discovered that their performance on this task improved after taking psilocybin. Fisher, discussing these findings with Terence later on, remarks, You see, what is conclusively proven here is that under certain circumstances, one is actually better informed concerning the real world, if one has taken a drug, than if one has not. I'm well aware that some of the methods used in this study have been criticized over the years. Small sample sizes and lack of control groups, for instance. However, I'm sure I'm not the only one that can attest to the fact that taking a little bit more than a microdose, say 100 to 200 milligrams, undeniably enhances visual clarity. In any case, as visual acuity is crucial for the success of a hunter-gatherer, it's clear that the discovery of an edible acuity enhancer would considerably improve the ability of those who availed themselves to it. This, in turn, would make them more effective at feeding their offspring, and with the increase in available food, this would yield a higher probability of their offspring reaching reproductive age. From this factor alone, a gradual outbreeding and decline of non-psilocybin-using groups would be a natural consequence. Could this be the reason why we're the only human species still around? And so it follows that when taken in slightly larger doses, feelings of restlessness and sexual arousal can be expected. Terence describes how at this second level of usage, by increasing instances of copulation, the mushrooms directly favored human reproduction. It's possible that our hominid ancestors discovered a connection between lunar cycles and mushroom availability. Though evidence may be scarce, the notion that humans could have aligned their fornication practices with these cycles may have served as an important first step towards ritual and religion. Certainly at the third and highest level of usage, religious concerns would be at the forefront of the tribe's consciousness simply because of the power and strangeness of the experience itself. Quote, This third level, then, is the level of the full-blown shamanic ecstasy. The psilocybin intoxication is a rapture whose breadth and depth is the despair of prose. It is wholly other, and no less mysterious to us than it was to our mushroom-munching ancestors. The boundary-dissolving qualities of shamanic ecstasy predispose hallucinogen-using tribal groups to community bonding and to group sexual activities, which promote gene mixing, higher birth rates, and a communal sense of responsibility for the group offspring. At whatever dose the mushroom was used, it possessed the magical property of conferring adaptive advantages upon its archaic users and their group. Increased visual acuity, sexual arousal, and access to the transcendent other led to success in obtaining food, sexual prowess and stamina, abundance of offspring, and access to realms of supernatural power. All of these advantages can be easily self-regulated through manipulation of dosage and frequency of ingestion. Some of McKenna's claims about the more causal effects of psilocybin are a bit speculative. Usually when people are looking for an aphrodisiac, psilocybin is rarely, if ever, on the list. Visual acuity is a potential effect, but it's usually in quantities so small that a scale is needed. It's tough to say whether or not ancient humans could have dosed precisely enough to get the effects they wanted. However, in January of 2024, an article published in the scientific journal Brain, might just strengthen some of Terence's ideas. A role for the serotonin 2A receptor in the expansion and functioning of the human transmodal cortex. The article outlines how serotonin 2A receptor signaling has driven the expansion of the human brain over evolutionary time. This is the same receptor that binds to psilocybin and other tryptamines. The transmodal cortex is involved in learning, memory, and higher level thinking. The 5-HT2A receptor is especially important in this area, suggesting that it has been crucial in the development of these advanced brain functions. I'm sure Terence would be absolutely thrilled by this news. 
The connection between early humans and cattle is one of critical importance. When our remote ancestors moved out of the trees and onto the grasslands, they increasingly encountered hooved beasts who ate vegetation. Not only did they serve as a source for potential sustenance, but as previously mentioned, the nutrient-rich dung of these ungulates serves as an ideal substrate for the growth of psilocybin. Mushrooms of this sort are classified as coprophilus, meaning dung-loving fungi. As early as the Miocene, several species of hominids co-evolved alongside these large ungulate mammals. In these receding grasslands, the evolutionary trajectory of both species would have become intertwined. Our ancestors quite literally might have been tripping on these mushrooms wherever they walked. It then seems extremely unlikely that they would have ignored such a curious phenomenon, especially as pastoralism became more widespread. And now let's venture into the dunes of the Tassili Najir Plateau. Within this curious geological formation resembling a labyrinth can be found some of the oldest known depictions of cattle, shamans, and mushrooms. With roots stretching back into the Neolithic, Tassili Najir's prehistoric cave art provides a set of compelling depictions of mankind's shamanic origins. It is here where we can find some of the earliest known illustrations of shamans grazing cattle, as well as what Terence dubbed the bee-faced mushroom shaman. What is depicted is clearly an anthropomorphic figure wearing some kind of mask, who is undeniably covered in mushrooms. In addition to this, there is the strange painting of the mushroom runners, which shows several figures surrounded by geometric features possibly representing their hallucinations, who appear to be dancing while holding mushrooms. Henri Lote, a French explorer and ethnographer, is responsible for mounting the first expedition to investigate the cave art in this region. Presenting these photographs to the world for the first time in the late 1950s, Lote was among the first to associate these paintings with shamanic ceremonies. He suggested that the caves in which they were found could have served as sacred sanctuaries. Furthermore, the ethnobotanist Giorgio Samarini considered them to be probably the oldest physical evidence of entheomycological practices, reflecting altered states of consciousness and dance rituals. The whole region is steeped in symbolic and mystico-religious symbolism and it seems that the earliest form that religion took on was some kind of a mushroom cult. Long before the birth of Christ, long before the Minoans and the Sumerians, what was possibly the most ancient human culture we know of engaged in shamanism and states of ecstasy. It is impossible not to see in the cult of the great goddess and the cattle cult of the late Neolithic a recognition of the mushroom as the third and hidden member of a kind of shamanic trinity. The mushroom, seen to be as much a product of cattle as our milk, meat, and manure, was recognized very early as the physical connection to the presence of the goddess. I find it quite interesting how many, if not most, religions and mythologies around the globe recognize cattle to be sacred. Could this be the reason why? Now, Terence McKenna draws the connection between ideas about nomadic partnership societies and the story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis, poetically suggesting, quote, The Tassili Najir of 12,000 BC may well have been the partnership paradise whose loss has created one of the most persistent and poignant of our mythological motifs, the nostalgia for paradise, the idea of a lost golden age of plenty, partnership, and social balance. I'll admit I do find it intriguing. The story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis is essentially the story of the emergence of consciousness. Before Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they were living in a paradisal state, perfectly in harmony with nature, unaware of their vulnerability, unaware of death, good and evil, and most importantly, unaware of self. It was only by the advent of consciousness and self-reflection that marked the fall from Eden 
and the beginning of history. If you're one of those who interpret biblical stories in a more literal sense, I don't see how this part of the Genesis story couldn't be seen as a psychedelic experience. Again, we're talking about a plant, of which it is said that if it were to be eaten, their eyes would be opened, they would know they're naked, and they would become as gods, knowing good from evil. It appears to quite plainly state that the emergence of self-awareness and a higher level of consciousness in man was catalyzed by means of a plant. Whether or not the true meaning of the Genesis story actually signifies or symbolizes humanity's first encounter with the vegetable logos remains unclear, compelling as it is. However, what is clear is that our ancient past is teeming with psychedelic use. In Western and Eastern Africa, the Fang and Maasai people used Tabernanthi Iboga and Acacia Nilotica, respectively. Ancient Iranians used Paganum Harmala, also known as Hauma, which is likely the mythical Soma drink spoken of in the Vedic traditions. The ancient Greeks employed ergotamine in their sacred brew, called the Kaikion. This was the sacred drink held in high regard that was used in the Eleusinian Mysteries, something that we'll talk about later on. Radiocarbon dating evidence has shown that native North American tribes made use of the peyote cactus as far back as 5,500 years ago. The Mazatec of Central America used psilocybin, and the Tucano of the South American Amazon brewed ayahuasca, or yahe, which is a combination of DMT and harmaline. There are of course many more examples throughout history, and all of the cultures mentioned have held these traditions since time immemorial. Small mouth noises, our special province, and with it we, we weave meaning, we convey emotion, uh, we convey anger, and eventually we recreate the entire world of our imaginations. I mean, this is what culture is, is a kind of coaxing into reality of the structures of the human imagination through the medium of language. And it begins as poetry and it ends as, you know, structural engineering on the scale of the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that. Language. Our ability to think and use language is connected to the size and structure of the human brain. Neural structures responsible for conceptualization, visualization, signification, and association are highly developed in humans. When we speak poetically or metaphorically, we are engaging with the realm of imagination. Our capacity to link the sounds we create with our mouths, with meaningful internal images, is a process akin to synesthesia. From this rapid expansion of human brain size came unprecedented changes in the social organization of the hominids. With it came the use of tools, fire, and language, all eventually cascading into the modern era. It has been called by some experts to be perhaps the fastest advance recorded for any complex organ in the whole history of life. The evolution of language is most certainly congruent with the evolution of hunter-gatherer groups. Often in these primitive nomadic groups, the task of foraging for fruits, nuts, seeds and the like would be done by the women. Because of this, it's possible that women were under much greater pressure to develop language than were their male counterparts. Unlike the silent, stalking activity of hunting, where long periods of waiting for the right moment to strike the prey was certain, gathering would have necessitated more complex forms of communication. Where does it grow? In what season does it grow? Is it edible, medicinal, or poisonous? We can imagine how those with a larger selection of linguistic labels of plants and their sources and methods of preparation were unquestionably placed in a position of advantage. Moreover, gathering is a highly social activity that would have probably been done among friend groups. This stands in direct contrast to the image of the lone male hunter. Hunting, being much more stoic, 
necessitates one to function on a very limited number of linguistic signals, thus limiting one to the use of silent cues and hand gestures. From this line of reasoning, it is highly probable that the emergence of language into more complex and nuanced forms can be at least in part attributed to the activity of foraging, the classification and delineation between various species of plants and herbs. What likely preceded this was the spontaneous vocal and poetic expressions that accompany the psilocybin experience. Enter Glossolalia. The ability to vocalize and make noises was of course present long before there was any notion about articulating meaning, conceptualizing ideas, or planning for the future and so forth. Humans have been hardwired to speak millions of years before they could convey complex ideas. Alternatively, language may have existed simply as a form of entertainment. Chanting, singing, speaking in tongues, for instance, that was eventually done during primitive rituals and ceremonies. If you spent any time listening to Terence's lectures on YouTube, you may have heard his comical imitations of glossolalia. Oh, what is glossolalia? Glossolalia, well, here's an example of it, then I'll define it. It's, it's language-like activity in the absence of meaning. The glossolalia, such as I just did, it is clearly under the control of rules, but it is not, there is no meaning conventionally conceived of there, but there is syntax. And I think probably that language was invented millennia before meaning, and that you could almost call glossal, uh, you could almost call language toneless singing. And that people used to sit around the campfire and amuse each other by making funny noises. As a kid, I used to do this. And then it was only much, much later that anything approaching linguistic conventionality was imposed on this. Language in the absence of meaning. It seems obvious to me that meaning only came about after the sudden expansion of human brain size. In other words, after the relationship between man and mushroom had been established. The linguistic depth that was gradually attained by gatherers eventually led to a momentous discovery, the discovery of agriculture. It was realized that the seeds of certain plants could be planted and grown in a set location. As a result, there was little need to venture out into the wild and leave the fields unattended. Only knowledge of a few plants and their needs were required, a more sedentary lifestyle was embraced, and nature as it was once known slowly faded into memory. At that point, the retreat from the natural world began, and the dualism of humanity versus nature was born. At places like Katalhoyuk and Jericho, humans and their domesticated plants and animals became for the first time physically and psychologically separate from nature. Paradoxically, more efficient utilization of plant resources through agriculture led to a breaking away from the symbiotic relationship that had bound human beings to nature. The agricultural revolution also coincides with the decline of shamanism and hallucinogen using groups. Use of hallucinogens can only be properly and regularly practiced in hunting and gathering societies. If an agriculturalist were to use these plants, it would make getting up at dawn the morning after to tend the fields a lot more difficult. As we mentioned at the very beginning, the plants and drugs that a society uses influences their values. The shift to agricultural societies came with the fermentation of fruits, grains, and honey. Beer, mead, and wine steadily usurped the mushroom. This gradual shift altered spiritual customs and traditions, effectively reshaping the course of human history in significant ways. As Western civilization emerged as the dominant form of society, the nature-bound, ego-dissolving practices of shamanism were gradually supplanted. 
direct experience with the transcendent other, the guy in mind of organic life, unified consciousness, however you want to call it, was not embraced by monotheism. As such, the gnosis of the transcendent became more and more esoteric, eventually being something reserved only for initiates of the mysteries. The tradition of plant-induced ecstasy lived on in its esoteric form during the Eleusinian mysteries. These were sacred ceremonial initiations and rites of passage held every year for the cult of Demeter and Persephone. Beginning in the Mycenaean period in ancient Greece around 1500 BC, the mysteries flourished for nearly 2,000 years until its demise in the 4th century AD. Shrouded in secrecy, initiates here would drink a sacred brew called the Kaikion. Brian Murarescu's The Immortality Key investigates this in astounding depth, ultimately concluding that it was a psychedelic of the ergot variety. The historical record is foggy regarding the details of what all went down here, with many ancient writers speaking very cryptically of the rites. The mysteries were said to be something that was experienced, where it was said that if you die before you die, you will not die when you die. Fragments of ergot, a fungus from which LSD is derived, were discovered in a temple dedicated to the two Eleusinian goddesses excavated at the Mas Castellar site. These fragments, found inside a vase and within the dental calculus of a 25-year-old man, provide strong evidence that ergot was an ingredient in the Eleusinian kaikion. The events that transpired at Eleusis were seen to be absolutely indispensable to the sustainability of the planet and its people. According to priests and hierophants of the time, without the mysteries, life would become unlivable. Peasants from all around the ancient world would come to witness a sight that made all other seeing seem like blindness. The penalty for divulging the secrets of Eleusis was death, and this is likely what allowed it to go on for so long, all the while leaving very little evidence in the historical record. It wasn't until the rise of Christianity in the 4th century that the age-old festivities at Eleusis were outlawed and finally came to an end. If you want a whole video on this, let me know in the comments. It's an endlessly fascinating subject that really pairs well with Terence's stoned ape theory. In essence, Apes ate mushrooms for spans of time in which millennia are but seasons. Slowly but surely, the divine spark of mankind emerged. Primitive glossolalia witnessed a cascading bifurcation as it unfolded into the highly complex neurological activity that is language. Plants and fungi that evolved alongside the Homo lineage were consecrated and deified fostering the earliest hints of what would eventually become modern religion. I'll admit the whole theory is a bit of a paradox. From higher levels of consciousness came endless possibilities. Long-established primitive rituals ossified into religious hierarchies and dogma. Climatic shifts over time made the sourcing of psychoactive plants unfeasible in some areas. For these reasons, the ways of old were gradually forgotten and in their place came symbols, elaborate ordeals, and pathological personalities. It seems that psychedelic plants gave rise to the very thing that abolished them, the conscious ego. In the campaign to rid the world of pagan influence, the church's mainstream Eucharist of ordinary bread and wine had replaced the original sacraments, now deemed heretical by the ruling class. Today, however, the psychedelic renaissance is alive and well. The field has matured since the misinformed hysteria of the 1960s. Scientific articles and papers are being published all the time, large-scale studies are ongoing, and the overall attitude towards these things are changing for the better. Thanks for watching. Till next time, stay curious. Peace.